hello everyone and welcome to From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm an information specialist in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources and Billy Thomas is back with us um, today. Um, and he's off from vacation and we greatly appreciate him being back and helping us out again and uh, so I just wanted to let you know that we have a great show lineup for you all today. Yeah. yeah, Renee, I'm so excited to be back. It was a nice week off, but you know, I just love Kentucky and there is no place like Kentucky and I'm so glad to be with everybody again today from the woods today. Um, a big shout out and thanks to um, Dr. Ellen Crocker for co-hosting last week. Um, Ellen, really appreciate you stepping in and uh, helping Renee out with the show. So um, uh, I'm excited about today. We've got three big segments today, Renee. We're going to be talking about the second part of Forestry 101 with Dr. Jacob Muller and then we're, he's going to be talking about forest ecology, and then we're going to have Laurie Thomas talking about a tree that you may not see around here, but you may see if you do make some travels um, around to the coastal areas. And then we have Dr. Matt Springer is going to be talking about a snake that you've probably seen, and you may have gotten confused with another one, so make sure you stick around for that one. So, um, But before we do that, Renee, I thought we could kick off again this show uh, with playing the theme song um, that was um, generated by um, Dr. Crocker's father. Put on your boots and walk into the forest where the squirrels are eating acorns and the chipmunks play. Under the shade of the tall and mighty oak where you can see what's going on from the woods today. From the woods today. mentioned last week again like you said anybody who's interested in uh, trying to write us a theme song go right ahead all it just has to have our from the woods today and it has to be something about the woods so yeah, uh, no make doubt. sure you have all those components in there but uh, we're going to get going with our show today uh, with our second segment of FOR 101. All right so uh, Renee I'll go ahead and pull that up but uh, Jacob I think we're going to try to get Jacob, Jacob on for a second. Um, Hey, Jacob, I appreciate you doing this um, uh, segment again. Um, I had a chance to preview it earlier and uh, pretty impressive work. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Billy. Yeah, it's great to be on here with, with you all and get to uh, kind of continue on this, this Forestry 101 journey. And we'll kind of be talking a little bit more about the science uh, of, of uh, forest ecology and forestry and why, why it's important that we kind of have this, this foundation as we think about how we manage our forests. So you might want to remind to, people yeah, too that you're going to do this as a series so and, it's not just a one-time thing and you're done so yeah yeah so we have uh seven um episodes planned out uh for for this series we did one uh back in june and that was kind of uh talking about why we manage our forests and why it's important to think about active management uh now we're going to be talking about forest ecology and then as we go on we'll be uh, talking about uh, managing our own our own woodlands and forests and thinking about developing management plans and, and planning for the future so and just as a reminder to our viewers out there um, these episodes have been recorded and are available so if you happen to miss the previous episode on forestry 101 then make sure you check that out on fromthewoodstoday.com you know jacob today we're going to be talking about forest ecology and you know one of the things i love about kentucky one of the many things i love about it is our great diversity in plants and animals that we have here you know i've had a chance to travel around the united states a little bit and around the world just a small amount um, but one of the unique things about kentucky is we just have such a wealth of flora and fauna here that it, it makes it really exciting and fun to get out in our woods yeah, yeah, we're, we're so lucky to live uh, in this place, in this region, where we basically get to experience and live uh, in these ecological systems and, and experience forest ecology every day. So it's, it's good. All right. So, so, Renee, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get to um, Dr. Muller's segment. And again, um, Jacob, we really appreciate you um, doing the effort um, for us with this. So yep. here we go. Hi. 
welcome back to Forestry 101. Uh, today we're going to be talking about forest ecology uh, and why uh, understanding uh, the ecological processes and functions uh, of the forest is so important. And so forest ecology is the scientific study of uh, interrelated patterns and processes uh, of flora and fauna uh, and the ecosystems within, within the forest. And so why is this uh, important uh, to forestry and to forest management? Well, because knowing and understanding these, these processes uh, allows us uh, to influence the structure of the forest and uh, the interactions to favor uh, particular species uh, or particular process. And so all trees uh, need certain requirements to grow and the ecology of the forest really dictates which tree will grow, which tree will survive, thrive, or die, uh, and which species will grow in a certain area and which species might not grow in a certain area. So as species interact and compete for resources, those resources being sunlight, uh, water, and nutrients, one species will typically be favored while another species will typically be disfavored. Uh, so that means this one particular species will outcompete another species for uh, limited resources. And so when species compete, we call that interspecific competition. Uh, when individuals of the same species compete with one another for limited resources, we call that uh, intraspecific um, competition. So as managers, we have some influence over the trajectory uh, of, of the forest. And so by controlling uh, stand structure, species compositions, uh, and in the timing that we, that we uh, intervene with the forest, we can really, uh, uh, we're able to achieve our management objectives uh, and really work within the, the confines of this ecological system to help us meet our management objectives. And so there are a few dominant factors that really play a major role in whether a tree will grow, uh, thrive, uh, or, or die. And these factors uh, include the life history, uh, attributes and strategies uh, of a tree, uh, the landscape history, uh, the light environment that the tree in the forest uh, is growing under, uh, soil and site uh, characteristics, uh, as well as pest, pathogen, and other uh, episodic uh, events or large episodic events that, that have a major uh, effect on, on the ecosystem. The results of these, these factors and interactions create a unique uh, forest setting, so a unique forest composition uh, of species as well as uh, unique forest uh, structures. And so the life attributes and strategies of a tree really come down to how a tree is adapted to grow uh, and, and reproduce in a certain forest setting. And so that uh, happens over time as a, as a species uh, adapts and evolves with the forest system to, to thrive and, and, um, and to reproduce and continually regenerate uh, the forest of that particular species. Uh, the life or the landscape history uh, is really related to the disturbance, the past disturbances, the disturbance regime uh, for that particular region and that forest type. And certain uh, disturbance regimes include uh, forest fire, uh, flooding, drought, other major uh, biotic and abiotic uh, disturbances. About light, we're talking about the quantity of light and the quality of light. <clears throat> so the quality of light is really related to the wavelength and the, the light that's coming from the sun to the forest. Uh, importantly, more importantly, the, the <clears throat> quantity of light uh, and that has to do with shade from trees and, and levels of, of canopy density as it <clears throat> reduces the amount of available light that's coming through the canopy down to the, the forest floor. And so this is a major uh, determinant of how well a tree will grow and, and how fast a tree will grow. 
<clears throat> and so different species have different tolerances of light. And so there's shade intolerant species which like to grow in full sunlight without a canopy uh, overhead. Uh, in fact, many of those species uh, won't grow at all under shady conditions. <clears throat> On the other end of the spectrum, there's shade tolerant species, which, which can grow and reproduce uh, in shaded conditions uh, underneath the canopy uh, and really uh, be maintained within that forest. Uh, when a gap opens up in the forest, they can take advantage of that and they're well suited uh, to move into the canopy at that point. <clears throat> so that creates this, these dynamics uh, in different structures in the forest based on the different light um, tolerances uh, for for a particular species. Soil is uh, an important uh, consideration and determinant of the forest in which trees uh, will grow, which species uh, of trees will grow in different regions. And so soil is really defined by, by the climate, uh, the organisms that are in the soil that, um, that um, decompose and become organic matter uh, in, in the top layers of the soil. Uh, the parent material, so the bedrock, uh, as well as topography uh, and time. So soils need time to develop and in more mountainous or more uh, areas that have higher topography, you'll see more erosion on uh, sedimentation and, and distribution uh, of those, those soils. And so soil is, is essentially the parent material uh, acted upon by by climate and, and organisms uh, and modified again by the climate and the topography uh, to, to define the, that uh, particular soil type that will accommodate uh, or, or prevent certain species uh, from growing. Uh, wildlife is another important consideration uh, here in Kentucky uh, as well as many other regions in the Northeast and in the Lake, Great Lakes states, uh, deer are a significant uh, a determinant of, of the forest in the species composition. Uh, deer are browsers and they're selective browsers and they'll select certain species, eat their bud tips, uh, and they might choose to not eat certain species uh, or they're not quite as tasty. And so uh, we'll see uh, deer can really control species compositions in a pretty dramatic way in certain regions where there's high uh, deer populations. Uh, lastly, pest uh, pathogens and, and other uh, large uh, events are really uh, fundamental in thinking about the forest, the forest structure, how forests uh, interact with disturbance. And so many trees are adapted to tolerate uh, a certain level of stress. And uh, these, these trees can really accommodate uh, endemic levels of many uh, disturbances sometimes we see stand replacing or large disturbances that wipe out uh, an entire forest and when that happens we're essentially setting uh, the forest back in time uh, and restarting this successional state where we start to see uh, more shade intolerant species growing up initially uh, and over time uh, there's more shade tolerant species that grow up underneath that uh, gaps open and so we get this multi-structured old growth stand uh, as, as forests uh, develop and go through these successional states. So tying it all together, we manage forest uh, as, as foresters and, and silviculturists uh, to control the structure, so the size, the, the number of trees, uh, the age of the trees. Uh, we control the, comp the composition, so the mixture of species, uh, as well as the timing uh, of, of our inter interventions. And so we can control the different levels within the forest when we come in and create uh, gap openings and create different structural layers within uh, that, that forest. So thinking about forest ecology and these natural forest processes, uh, forest succession and disturbance really go hand in hand. Uh, to develop a forest, um, many times we as managers uh, are, are removing trees to essentially capture what would naturally be lost uh, or killed through competition with other trees. So we're freeing up uh, space and resources for uh, more uh, desirable trees and more desirable uh, species. So uh, there's a lot uh, to consider when talking about forest ecology, and this was just a brief uh, introduction, but this will help set us up as we continue thinking about how we manage uh, forests as we go 
through uh, the next uh, few parts uh, of this series. very much Dr. Miller for doing that. We greatly appreciate it. Um, we, uh, anybody who has a question, I want to remind them to type it in the chat pod and um, he can see that and start answering, answering those questions. So it looks like, um, I know some people say, well, maybe I just won't do anything to my forest. Is that the route to go? Uh, it, it really depends, but we think that a lot of the past uh, management of these forests, a lot of these forests in the east have had some sort of disturbance, uh, whether that's human disturbance, whether we've gone through and, and really uh, taken out a lot of the good trees and left behind some of the lesser quality trees. And so uh, management is really important uh, when we're trying to promote forest health and, and really focus on more desirable species, um, more natural species uh, as well. Jacob, I was thinking of as you were doing your show, and, and I wanted to co uh, compliment you on the outstanding production value there. Wow, man, you're really up in the game here for us. I appreciate that. Um, it was really well done. Um, but, you know, forest ecology was, in my mind, one of the most important classes I took in college as becoming a forester, just to understand the interactions of, you know, of the trees and the animals and the soils and all of that. And I thought you did a really good job kind of laying that out. But I think as, as Renee was thinking about, um, you know, if, if we don't manage our forests today, uh, certainly here in Kentucky, there there's some threats that are facing them um, that may prohibit you from getting what you want out of your forest, whether it be invasive species or, or uncontrolled wildfire or other things like that. So, um, you know, like you said, I guess it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish, but I would encourage folks in Kentucky at least to understand what's going on in their forest, even if they don't want to actively manage it and um, make sure that they assess it as far as any threats that are happening to it now. So. Right. Yep. Any questions for Jacob? Um, Jacob, so what are we going to be talking about on your next segment of Forestry 101? Uh, so the next one we're going to be uh, talking uh, how to talk to a forester essentially as a landowner and so hopefully that'll help uh, if if you're uncomfortable and you, you don't really know where to start, but you have some woodland that you'd like uh, to think about managing, uh, the next episode will kind of get you on your way to, to thinking about management and some questions to maybe ask a forester and, and even some, some lingo or, or language that uh, you might want to use that could help kind of convey uh, your ideas into an actual clear message. One of our um, regular uh, viewers, Hannah, had noticed that, you know, some of her ash trees, you know, had been dying and then she's starting to see some regeneration come up under them of some different species. Uh, you know, I guess kind of part of that successional process that you were talking about there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's hard to describe uh, some of these complex ideas in, in 10 minutes, but uh, <laughs> it, is, it is so important when we're thinking about the stand dynamics and, and how, how trees can can grow underneath canopies and uh, oftentimes we'll see these shade uh, tolerant species that kind of hang around or we call them advanced region that are hanging out in the understory and then when there is an opening uh, in the forest whether that's natural uh, or, or man-made then uh, those trees are in a position to uh, move into the, the canopy and so it's yeah real complex. It is, you know, and I would say certainly in central Kentucky, one of the things that a lot of our woodland owners are having to deal with today uh, and recently is the emerald ash borer and its impact on ash trees. And what we've seen a lot of times those trees die out, Renee, and then underneath them are all these invasive plants like bush honeysuckle and other things that just really explode in that. So, I mean, again, I would encourage if you're a landowner, uh, you need to kind of know what's going on in your woods, even if you're not planning to actively manage or harvest or anything, because things can you know, happen on you that maybe that you don't want. Yeah. Right. When you are talking about regen and different trees coming up after that, how, and I guess they're called tree seeds, how long can seeds last that's in the ground that you're seeing? Like she says, she's seeing stuff pop up that, you know, she hasn't been seeing before. So how long can they last in the ground? Uh, it really depends on, on, the, on the tree. Yeah, anywhere from, uh, and it depends on, on the climate as well but i would say here there's they can hang around for for a while uh different animals will eat seeds and then 
redistribute those seeds in other areas and right. uh, so it's you might see some some things coming up and maybe you don't really have a, a tree right around you're wondering how that how that got there so little critters are pretty good at moving things around as well but uh, that's kind of going back to what we we're saying uh, that's kind of reiterates why it's so important to think about managing because a lot of these invasive plants can hang around and grow in the understory and then really outcompete uh, seedlings and desirable species when uh, when those gaps do open up and so there's lots of silvicultural techniques we'll get into some of those uh, throughout this course thinking about that all right well again thank you very much we greatly appreciate all that you contribute to our to the from the woods today yeah, yeah no doubt and we'll look forward to the next segment too jacob so thank you very much all right thank you all right all right so moving on so i know we're going to switch gears a little bit Exactly. So we have Lori Thomas in back from vacation as well. And like she said, she is uh, bringing us a coastal tree. <laughs> yeah, this week, um, yeah, I had an, a nice visit, but um, this week's tree of the week is the live oak. Um, and if any of you all have been to the, the coastal Atlantic region around Florida or along the Gulf Coast, you've probably seen this tree. Um, it is a tree that I saw everywhere while I was visiting Oak Island, North Carolina. Um, I was certainly impressed by the town's namesake oak trees. They were, like I said, they were everywhere natively, naturally, and also used extensively in landscape plantings there as well. Um, the live oaks are particularly well suited for coastal environment. They have really dense wood and a, a short trunk and tend to have broad, low canopies. So that makes it suitable for that constant um, oceanic wind. Um, and also they're tolerant of salt spray. And the trees, I know I've been going to um, Oak Island for many years. And um, many of these trees you, you can actually see, and you'll see some of them in the show, how they how manipulated by the wind, but these trees, um, live oaks are very, you know, they've survived many coastal storms and hurricanes, and it's, it's just a great tree. So I hope you enjoy learning a little bit about the tree of the week, which is the live oak this week. Great. All right, folks, um, just as a general reminder, if you have questions for um, Jacob or Laurie or Matt coming up in a little bit, please put them in the chat pod and we'll get to them. But um, Renee, I think I'll go ahead and get started with um, Laurie's video. Hi, I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the tree of the week, the live oak. I do want to point out the live oak is not native to Kentucky, but it's found on the southern Atlantic coast and in the Gulf of Mexico. Live oak, Quercus virginiana, also called Virginia live oak and southern live oak, is an evergreen-like tree that comes in a variety of forms, from shrubby and dwarfed to large and spreading, depending upon the site. It's fast growing on good sites, and it can live up to 200 to 300 years old. It's considered a medium-sized tree that can grow to massive proportions with crown spreads of up to 150 feet. In parts of its range, it's easily identified by the rounded clumps of ball moss or thick drapings of Spanish moss. Live oak grows on a variety of sites. It is typically found on sandy soils of low coastal areas because it's tolerant of salt spray and steady ocean wind. As you can see in this photo of a tree that's less than a block from the ocean, you can see how the wind has manipulated that canopy. However, it grows in dry sandy woods or moist rich woods as well. Live oak occurs on the lower coastal plain of the southeastern United States from southeastern Virginia to Florida, including the Florida Keys and west to southeastern Texas. The leaves of live oak are alternately arranged on the twig and simple in form, meaning one blade. And you can see where we've got it circled how you can see that they're alternate. They are leathery and are nearly evergreen, but they actually replace their leaves over a short period of a few weeks in early spring. The leaves are two to five inches long and typically elliptical or oblong in shape. Sometimes the leaves have bristle tips, but usually not. Live oak is monoecious, which means one house. This means that a tree will have both male and female flowers. Male flowers are in drooping catkins, and you can see that in the photo, and the female flowers are small spikes. The flowers bloom in early spring, typically March through May be May, depending on the area, and the flowers are wind pollinated. The fruit is an acorn that grows in clusters of three to five. 
the acorns are dark brown to nearly black, and the warty cap encloses about a third of the nut. The acorns mature in one growing season and drop in the fall. The acorns will germinate shortly after dropping, and they are dispersed by gravity and wildlife. The sweet live oak acorns are an important food source for many birds and mammals, including northern bobwhite, Florida scrub jay, mallard, sapsucker, wild turkey, black bear, squirrels, and white-tailed deer. Since it maintains its leaves most of the year, live oak provides cover for birds and mammals, and the threatened Florida scrub jay nests in the live oak trees. The bark on young trees is reddish brown with froze, as you can see in the left hand photo, and sometimes has small surface scales. As the tree matures, the bark gets darker and much more blockier. The wood of live oak is heavy and strong. It has a light to medium brown color, though there can be a fair amount of variation in color. The grain is straight with a coarse, uneven texture. It has large to very large pores arranged radially, as you can see in the end grain photo. Many of the pores are filled with tyloses. The wood is very resistant to decay, but due to its density, it is harder to work than the other oak species. Live oak wood was used widely for shipbuilding during the era of wooden ships because the wood is the hardest and the densest of the oak species, and it can handle the ravages of salt water. In fact, many shipwrights or shipbuilders thought it was the most durable wood in the world. Early famous live oak ships include the USS Hancock, launched in 1776, the USS Constitution, launched in 1797, and the USS Constellation, also launched in 1797. It was so valuable in shipbuilding that the United States government, under the leadership of John Quincy Adams, purchased land in 1828 to reserve the valuable live oak resources. The land was the Naval Live Oaks Reservation near what is today Gulf Breeze, Florida. Currently, the land comprises over 1,300 acres in Gulf Islands National Seashore and is managed by the Department of Interior and National Park Services. Additionally, live oak has long been used in landscape plantings because of its habit of forming a low, widespreading crown, which makes a wonderful shade tree in the right landscape. The national champion live oak is in Ware, Georgia. It's 440 inches or over 36 feet in circumference, 78 feet tall, with a 161 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about national champion trees, go to American Forest Champion Tree National Register. Now for a few fun facts about live oak. Oak Alley Plantation is a historic plantation located on the west bank of the Mississippi River in the St. James Parish of Louisiana. The alley is from the French Allee or Canopy Path. This one was created by a double row of live oak trees about 800 feet long. They were planted in the early 18th century. The alley or tree avenue runs between the home and the river. This property has been designated a National Historic Landmark for its architecture and landscaping. The live oak is the official state tree of Georgia. Native Americans made an oil from the acorns that's comparable to olive oil. The USS Constitution, which we saw earlier in the program, is the world's oldest commissioned naval vessel still afloat. It's also known as Old Ironsides due to the strength of its hull, which was constructed of live oak. It was launched in 1797, retired in 1881, and is today a designated museum in the former Charlestown Naval Yard in Boston. The angel oak tree is one of the monument live oaks and a symbol of Charleston. It is located on Johns Island near Charleston, South Carolina. The tree is over 66 feet tall, 28 feet in circumference, and it produces shade that covers over 17,000 square feet. It is a must-see tree if you make it to the area. I hope you've enjoyed learning about the live oak, and if you get a chance to visit the southern Atlantic coast or the Gulf of Mexico, look for the legendary live oak. That was a great video about one of our coastal trees. We greatly appreciate Lori doing that. And um, if you have any questions for Lori, you can type them in the chat pod. Don't forget about that. But Lori, I want to ask you, can we plant that tree here? Um, well, it's hardy in zones eight to 10. 
So um, that's where it's native. Um, if you did plant it here, some plantings have been done in zone seven, which is our zone. Um, it, it's gonna be susceptible to any kind of uh, frost or cold weather damage. Um, it's not super cold hardy, but it's possible. I mean, you could plant it here. I mean, it was suggested if you wanted to plant something similar that you would go with um, more like a, a willow oak would be a good alternative and um, something similar to that. So yeah, it is, it was great. I really enjoyed um, doing this one because I got to learn a lot of stuff. It wasn't a tree that, you know, we briefly studied it in school, um, but to actually learn more about the live oak, it was really neat. And I've seen the angel oak, if you ever get a chance to see some of those big, massive oak trees along the, the southern Atlantic coast or in, around Florida, do it. It's, it's just amazing. Those trees are yeah, beautiful. Okay, so someone was wondering if it does it have much commercial value? Um, from what I understand from my research, um, it's used for small products. You know, it has a very short trunk. It's not a big, tall, clean um, lumber out of it. It doesn't have a tremendous amount of commercial value any longer, but for smaller items it would. Um, and, and in part because we don't usually build wooden ships anymore. So, but we may have like Eric, Gracie or Darren Morris may want to chime in. Having worked with the Kentucky Division of Forestry, they may have a, a feel about um, that. But from my research, um, it, it was listed as not having much commercial value today, except for as a landscape tree, which is a wonderful landscape tree in the right landscape. Yeah, someone said in uh, Callaway County, they've planted it from acorns and they're about 20 years old now. So. Excellent. And so, and they've, and they've nice. survived. So that's great. They're in, it's in a good area for them, maybe some protection. But yeah, that was one of the things in the zones. Um, when we can have these prolonged periods of cold, it can be hard on the trees, can cause damage. I can see that, but we don't seem to have much of those anymore. So. <laughs> I see somebody else has also seen that angel oak in South Carolina. It is spectacular. Yeah. Laurie, I was going to ask, uh, is the stature uh, or the, I guess the height of the tree, how closely is it tied to being close to the coast? Is that kind of what's beating it down, you think? Because um, I, I was thinking too about if you're going to like cut lumber out of this to build a ship, you know, how did they have large enough bowls to, to do well, that? To answer the second part of that first, because I don't know that I have an answer as to why it has that that growth form, and that growth form is really more in an open setting. You know, like we see our bur oaks and stuff here; they'll have a big trunk and a big broad canopy if they're open grown. You know, in a wooded setting, maybe not quite so much. But how the oaks were used, the the live oak was used in shipbuilding. They have you saw like in the the angel oak, all those big, long, heavy branches on that tree, they would cut and they tended to be curved. They would cut wood out of that, which kind of worked nicely for the hull of the ship. Or, and then they pieced stuff together. Yeah. So. Oh, very interesting, really. Yeah, thank you so much. I know a lot of people have probably seen that tree over the years and kind of wondered what it was. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, now they know. Yeah. yeah. Someone asked you, was it taller and straighter when used for shipbuilding? Um, uh, I guess for, kind of what I was asking. Yeah, yeah so no, I would assume and, yes, but no, they it, from from my research they pieced together or they used those sections of limbs which are tree size anyway. A lot of them are for those open grown ones, but for the smaller ones they pieced all that stuff together. Some of those looked big enough to be a ship. <laughs> 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 Hey, that's pretty cool. Uh, another great tree of the week, Laurie. Thank you so yeah. much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. That. I enjoyed doing it. It was a lot of fun learning about it. Oh, oh good, good. We'll look forward to another tree of the week next week as well. So Excellent. thanks. And we really appreciate your um, contributions to the show. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So moving on to our snake ID. So I know. So Renee, this one, when I got to see this one, I was like, oh, Matt, you did a good job with this one. The one that we're about to see is so common, you know, here in Kentucky. And I know many people have probably seen it and many people have probably freaked out when they saw it. So um, uh, I don't want to give it away yet, but right. um, I think um, people are going to enjoy it. So, so Matt, you want to, without giving it away, maybe give a little <laughs> bit of its temperament? Sure, it's uh, the one snake I do not ever want to pick up. Okay, fair oh, enough. That's yeah. a very good clue there. Yeah, it's the one that no matter, every time I've ever come across it, it is the meanest snake I've ever met. So they have a bad personality. It's like the biker gang of the snake world. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. Well, Billy, let's figure out what the snake is so we don't spill right. it there for a minute. I know, <laughs> let's go ahead I know and watch everybody's the video. sitting on the edge of their seats. What is this snake? This angry, mean snake in Kentucky. So, all right. All right. Without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and um, get Matt's video with the snake ID of the week. I want to start off by highlighting our snake ID website found at kysnakes.uky.edu. It is our centralized location for information about all of the species that we have in Kentucky. Uh, and it also has the ID your snake tool uh, present within it uh, so that you can try to use that to if you saw a uh, or got a quick glimpse of a snake uh, or got a really good glimpse of a snake, you can try to use those features that we're going to talk about here today uh, to ID that species. So let's take a look at our image that was submitted for uh, identification. And this is coming from North Central Kentucky. As you can see, it's in a water body, uh, probably a pond or a lake, um, where we have cattails. And this snake is in the cattails, probably trying to get away from who's taking this picture. Uh, but this is a pretty common um, way we encounter snakes in this setting, where we have a a snake that's all along the shoreline trying to skirt us maybe or get around us or potentially looking for food in those that area and then we just happen to encounter it at the same time. So if we try to identify this snake we're going to look at some of the features and you can see a few here. Uh, the pr one that's really clear is that banding pattern on the snake and thankfully we have really nice clear water to see that. But if we try to find out if this snake is either venomous or non-venomous we'll start off by trying to zoom into that head and see if we can pick out any of those features like the uh, pupil shape, head shape, whether there's a pit present at the front of the, the head. Uh, and unfortunately, no matter how much work we do editing this picture, it's not going to get any better and we can't see any of those features. So none of those which are really um, more reliable and easier for, for beginners to pick up uh, are present. Okay, so let's go back to that that bigger picture, that clear picture, the full image, and we can see that banding pattern. So let's let's zoom in on that because honestly, that's what we need to know for this uh, snake. And our options here, you know, being in North Central Kentucky uh, and the water, a lot of people will think that, you know, with the banding pattern present, there's a couple of different options. One being Copperhead, okay, that would be the one that everyone tends to jump towards. The second being uh, water moccasin or cottonmouth, which being in North Central Kentucky isn't actually an option. They don't tend to uh, be found east of the Green River. Uh, so it's mostly a Western Kentucky species. They do have a banding pattern uh, that's variable, uh, but they have a very, very triangular head. So knowing location, that kind of eliminates them from, as an option here. So if we zoom into that banding pattern, and if we're thinking copperhead, what we see here is that we have the dark and light banding that varies. If we zoom into the dark banding and look at that though, the dark banding is widest at the top of the body and narrows as it goes to the belly, which gives us an upside down Hershey kiss, whereas the copperhead would have that reverse where it's narrow at the belly and, and or wide at the belly and narrows at the top of the back. So it's not a copperhead. And they, they can be found in the water. They're, they're, they swim just fine. Uh, they're unlikely to be there, but they can be found there. So they shouldn't be, you know, eliminate them right off the bat if you're in the water. However, knowing that we have a banding snake in north central Kentucky um, where there's limited other snakes that would be found in the water with bands, our answer, um, if we look at it, is actually one of the most common snakes in Kentucky uh, if in and around water bodies, and that is our common or northern water snake. These guys have a pretty strong banding pattern. They're really common, can be found at pretty high densities, especially if there's a lot of prey items, which are uh, smaller fish, amphibians, uh, and even rodents um, or birds um, that are near uh, any source of water. They can be travel a little bit further away from a water body. However, it's not common to find them, say, in the middle of a field or uh, in the woods. But uh, completely harmless. However, they have a little bit of attitude problem uh, and will bite you if you try to pick them up. And it, they have some, enough of a teeth presence there that can hurt. Um, so not one that I recommend um, toying around with. So to end this week, I want to, as I always do, I want to talk about, you know, making sure that you identify what snake you're dealing with and what you see and uh, make the appropriate decision. 
Re if you want less snakes around, reduce those shrubby areas around your house or garden, keep your grass mowed short. That'll help eliminate cover for the snakes and also cover and, and food sources for the prey they may be after. Remember, these guys have a lot of positive benefits to having them around. It's full on garden season right now. So having a, a rat snake near and around that will help uh, eliminate any other uh, small pests from, from uh, taking away the food that you work so hard to grow. Uh, and as, as always, you know, we have our, our snake website as a resource found at ksnakes.uky.edu, or you can uh, absolutely use our uh, extension group as a resource if you have any other questions. So don't hesitate to reach out. And thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Matt. That was a great video and a water snake. So now we can give it away since you already have. <laughs> so so um, since they are called a water snake and they do spend a lot of time in the water, do they spend any time on land? Yeah, so uh, it's not uncommon that if you're, um, you know, adjacent to a water body that there uh, could be very much on land. They're not limited to being in nothing but the water. Uh, so they, they can come up. Uh, they tend not to go too far from any water source, but um, it's possible that you come across them for sure. Okay. And we did have a question wanting to know if a water snake and a rat snake is the same thing. Uh, they are not the same thing. There's definitely uh, some distinctive uh, body features uh, for uh, the two types of snakes. Um, whereas a, a rat snake is usually our gray rat snake. Uh, milk snakes are sometimes lumped in there um, within Kentucky. Um, so they're not, they have some features that are different, like rat snakes will lay eggs um, for bearing young, whereas our water snakes actually um, have eggs within their body and the eggs actually hatch inside them and they give live birth. Uh, so which is kind of neat. Uh, several other snakes have that, the uh, venomous species have that as well. So they're, they're a little different, um, but um, you know, in terms of size, shape, uh, and um, you know, that's kind of the things people key in on. They're, they're, they look very similar. I can see why people might think that's a copperhead just because it, you should just glance at it. You're like, oh, <laughs> maybe yeah, I should stay a away. Wide, wide range of banding uh, coloration. So they can, um, you know, be very light or very dark. That red pattern can come through on them sometimes as in that picture on the website. Sometimes it can be rather um, dull. Uh, so <laughs> it, it, you know, it, it's so hard with uh, snakes and because there's so much variation in their color patterns. Okay. We also had a question, is it true that bites include a bad bacteria that will cause problems at the bite site? Yeah, so um, that's one of the things that they do have some saliva, and, and this is true with most of the snake species, they have some saliva that's present that, that like our saliva has bacteria in it. So you definitely, if you, you get bit, uh, though they are non-venomous, you want to clean that wound out um, as best as possible and, and monitor it for any kind of signs of infection. It seems, at least my personal experience is whenever I get bit by a water snake, they tend to hurt more and they, they do seem to be irritated a little bit more than normal, uh, which may be due to that bacteria load that they're referring to. Uh, Matt, I was going to say, I can't help but think of Hershey Kisses now whenever I see on these snakes. Uh, but I mean, it's really what a great little kind of uh, thing to look at, like a visual cue to be able to tell as far as that, um, the way that banding looks. So uh, it's a good tip. I don't yeah. know if I want to relate chocolate to a copperhead, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania. I grew up not too far from Hershey, so I'm just trying there to do them go. a little favor and keep them going. <laughs> no doubt. You know, I, I love my chocolate, so I'll just, I'll go with that. Yeah, I think most of us would kind of be in your boat, man. I think we're all mostly chocolate fans, so. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you, Matt. We greatly appreciate yeah. you doing these snake IDs uh, for yeah. us every now and then and uh, getting, getting a little more knowledge on what kind of snakes yeah. are out there. I was going to remind our viewers out there, if they've got pictures of snakes or whatever, they can send them to us on our fromthewoodstoday.com. We have a little survey link where you can upload images and stuff like that. So if you've seen something out there, um, snake or otherwise, that you want identified, um, please use that, uh, that mechanism to let us know and we'll try to address it. And sometimes that's how we get you know, ideas for a uh, snake of the week, Matt will go, Ooh, I like that snake. Let's use it. You know, so uh, we get, we get them that way. And then you can find out on the air. We've actually had someone who has submitted a snake and they were watching and they got all their information on that snake of the week right then. So it's a great little tool for you. If you, if you happen to see a snake. <laughs> all right. Well, it looks like there's no other questions, Matt. So we greatly appreciate you doing your, your video again this week. As always, I'm happy to be here. You guys have a wonderful rest of the day. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Oh, uh, Renee, another great show, right? Three nice right. segments there. Uh, yeah, very pleased. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I was going to say, if you, uh, uh, something that just came out today, this may not be of interest to everyone, but I think for those that are woodland owners, this may be of interest to you. Um, today, the Kentucky Division of Forestry just released their delivered log prices. And I just wanted to show, Renee, real quick, uh, if people are interested in kind of understanding how much logs are going for in any part of the state. I was just going to show them real quick and let them know how they can um, find and access that information. So if you don't mind, I'm going to share that uh, real quick. So, so what you're seeing right now, and I'll make it full screen, this is the Kentucky Division of Forestry, and they put out this delivered log price report. So this is basically the value of logs that are delivered to a sawmill. Now, it's important to note that this does not account for the logging cost. This is just what the mills would pay if that wood was delivered. Um, if you want to receive a copy of this, you can email stuart.west at ky.gov and he can add you to the mailing list. Um, but what I want to show you real quick is they break the state down into these four regions. And so you can see there region one, two, three, or four. So you find the region that you reside in. Um, and then there's a little cue here of what these species codes mean um, for each of these. And then you can see for each of these regions. So like here at the top, we're looking at region three and it gives you kind of these species codes and then you can go back to that other thing. So like, for example, there, red oak and region three um, at the high values are going for $450 per for thousand board feet. So I just wanted to uh, let folks know that this is a resource that's available to them. Um, and again, you can um, stuart.west at ky.gov and we can put that in the chat pod for you. And he said that you can email him and he will add you to the mailing list um, for that. So thank you very much for putting that in there, stuart.west at ky.gov. So if you are interested in receiving that delivered log price reporting as they come out, um, just shoot Stuart an email and he'll be glad to um, add you to that. Thanks, Renee, for letting me share that real quick. Sure, no problem, because if you, if you need that kind of information, that's very valuable information to have. Yeah, no doubt. You know, and again, if there, you all have other questions um, regarding forests and natural resources, um, wildlife, or otherwise here in Kentucky, please don't hesitate to let us know, and we'll do our very best to get you some responses. And again, we're always looking for show ideas. So um, if you have a show idea, well, you know, it might not be on next week, but um, we can definitely get them on. Um, if there is something that you're just dying to know, um, we can get you more information on that um, and give you some information in the meantime up until we do the show as well. So, but it looks like this show is finished. So mm -hmm. Billy, uh, thank you again for helping me co-host this show. Mm -hmm. I greatly appreciate it. We missed you last week, um, but Ellen did a great job helping me out. And uh, so we greatly appreciate her as well. But um, so it looks like uh, we're done for today. Just remember, right. always go to fromthewoodstoday.com um, if you wanna see past shows, if you missed any, or to submit mm -hmm. that survey and send us pictures or any kind of suggestions. Yeah, no doubt. It's always a pleasure to do this show, Renee. I appreciate all the work you do. And um, I want to give a big shout out to all of our Facebook Live viewers out there. Um, it, a reminder, if you all do have comments, please, you can put those comments in Facebook and we're trying to respond to those as appropriate. Um, but thank you all for joining us as well. And if you wanted to join us live, like Renee said, just go to fromthewoodstoday.com and you can join us in the Zoom room as well if that works better for you. But again, we're just glad to have you all with us and um, we look forward to seeing you again next week. Make sure to tune in Wednesdays at 11. Take care.